Yeah, right. Um, thanks for your introduction. Yeah, as you said, I will today uh, talk a little bit about measuring the Tor network. So uh, basically what you can measure, what you can see inside um, the network. So my talk is uh, divided into pa uh, parts. So I will uh, first give you a short introduction and then go a little bit into detail into the measuring uh, steps. So who am I? So it's quite common to introduce yourself. So my name is Jens Kubitzil. I'm uh, based in Germany, uh, do IT security there, basically uh, penetration testing and other kinds of uh, IT security. Besides that, I'm a data protection officer. So, um, so Germany, as you might know, has quite uh, strict data protection laws and I, I help companies to do uh, to have a, a good data protection inside their companies. So, and I also do lectures at the, our local university. I wrote a book and uh, did several other things. So, and if you'd like to contact me, I have a Twitter handle called QBI and also a new social handle, which is the same, and you can also write me a mail. So, um, yeah, that's the thing. And, yeah, the first question to you, um, who of you has heard about Tor before? Hands up. Okay, so maybe the better question is, who has never heard of Tor? Okay, this, that, this was what I was expecting, basically. So uh, Tor is quite well known um, inside the, the community, so you might know that Tor is, is the, the software and the protocol for protecting <coughs> the privacy and anonymity of its users. Um, it's also Tor is a, is a network of relays, of bridges, directory, authorities, etc. And uh, that's also a thing where I come into play. So you might have heard of the organization called torservers.net. And um, I, within this organization, I also run some, uh, some relays, some bridges, etc. So uh, I'm, when, when it comes to Tor, I'm basically here somewhere in the, in the middle. Uh, with, with Tosavos.net and uh, with Tosavos.net there are lots of other organizations which, which do the same basically. Um, but Tor is also an, an organization and right now uh, there are like 40 sub-projects of all kinds. Uh, so uh, Tor has, has grown quite large in the last few years. So um, I just will go through the uh, how Tor works slides. I hope you have seen it before. But uh, I will need some details later on. That's why I, I decided uh, to show you those slides again. So um, you see here on the left-hand side, Alice, who wants to, to connect to the Tor network. So and as a first step, uh, Alice Tor client goes to a directory authority called Dave in the left uh, bottom and downloads a list of all uh, Tor servers, selects then three uh, Tor servers, and then connects to those servers. So Make, makes a, a connection to the first one, and uh, after that it, uh, it goes like a telescope and, and extends the connection to the second and to the third, and the, uh, the packets go back and forth through this uh, multiple encrypted uh, links. And after some minutes, the uh, connection changes, and uh, Alice will choose another circuit and so on. So that's the, the basic functionality. I hope everyone has heard of it, so if not, uh, just raise your hand. So and when it uh, well, when we when I talk about Tor, the the most user-facing thing I'd say is the Tor browser bundle. Uh, you as you can see it here, you can download it at the Tor uh, website, and in, it includes a, a patched and rebranded version of Mozilla Firefox, the Tor software itself, Tor button, and no script, and, and tries to to protect the user, basically when it goes to the net. But there are some uh, sub-projects, some of the 40s are called Tor Messenger, for instance. Tor Messenger is an instant messaging client with, which was um, uh, published uh, recently. Um, also, there is another uh, instant messaging client called Ricochet. Ricochet, uh, uh, so to Tor Messenger uses the XMPP protocol and, and other protocols, for instance, you can use it with several protocols, while Ricochet uses uh, this uh, so-called hidden services uh, for instant messaging, so it has another approach. So also when you use uh, some mobile phone, there's Orbot with Orfox for Android, there's an Orb Onion browser for iPhone, so you can use it there. Or if you want to sh uh, share files, you can use Onion Share. And this Onion Share software also uh, opens a hidden service, and you get some 
quite unguessable URL, send it to the other party, it downloads the, the software and then the, the hidden service closes again. So that's also an idea. And there are, as I said, quite a lot of other sub project I just wanted to mention uh, some of them, them into my, in my introduction. So and besides the uh, uh, part of anonymity, Tor also works in the uh, area of censorship resistance. So Tor receives quite lots of, of funding uh, to develop uh, censorship resistance. So uh, the, soft, the idea is that the software works in countries with quite heavy censorship. So you can go uh, to, to China, to Iran, to uh, several other countries and uh, use the Tor software there. And uh, the approaches are called bridges. So bridges is the, the basic idea. And uh, on top of that, there are so-called pluggable transports, which uh, obfuscate uh, the traffic so that the sensor isn't able to decide that you do some things he doesn't want, basically. So, and especially in China, this OPS4 thing, which is here on the uh, right-hand side here, works quite reliably, also scramble suit, and other approaches work also good in other countries. So that was my, my short introduction in the tour. Um, as I expected, most of you have already heard about the software. And now I will go a little bit more into detail uh, what it means to measure um, the network. So um, I do quite often talks about Tor. I, I uh, teach people about Tor, uh, talk about Tor, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I often hear some questions. So uh, some people want to know how many users does Tor have, where the users come from, and also, well, one of the most asked questions is the, the middle one here: Why is Tor so slow? Um, um, yeah, this, this, these are some, some questions which come from the user side. But since 2013, I often heard the question, well, how many relays does the NSA run? How many relays does the GCHQ or any other intelligence agency? And also, there are some, some other kind of questions. So, and this question needs uh, some answers. The user demanded an answer. And so, to answer those questions, um, you need to measure the network. You need to do uh, uh, measurements here, and, and that's why uh, everything uh, began. So, it's, so the, the first uh, uh, ideas when it comes to measuring are quite, quite old, they're like, like seven years old or so. But um, the main thing is, well, on the one hand side, you have an anonymity network. And well, how, you, how will you do measurements without hurting the anonymity of the users? This, this uh, feels like a contradiction. And I uh, provided a, a small example to show you what uh, Toro is thinking about, what, what they uh, do here to protect the users. So the idea here is to answer one of the first questions, where uh, do the user come from? So basically, uh, you want to know what uh, countries uh, the, the, the two users come from. And yeah, you want to measure those data without hurting the anonymity of the, the single users. So first of all, you need to get an idea where you can extract those data. And basically, there are two uh, points where you can extract the data. So the first one is the um, uh, entry node, the first node in the network. So this this one here. So and since several years, the design has changed a little bit. Um, so this, the, uh, this uh, slide here. Uh, showed you the, the Tor connection, and when I uh, switch to the next slide here, you saw that also here the uh, entry node changes. This is an, an older older slide right now, so that the first node, the, the uh, node here on the left hand side, uh, stays the same for quite a while, because uh, this is done to prevent some some attacks, and so Tor switch to this so-called guard node design. So uh, when you uh, connect to uh, the to Tor network, the first node stays the same for several weeks, and then it will change. So and, and of course, the first node sees the real IP address of Alice, because, well, it needs to connect to the first node with its real IP address. So what you can do, basically, is just ask the, the guard node, the entry node, to the store in some way the IP address and then mm, analyze this data. So that's the, the one idea. Another idea is to uh, ask the directory authority. 
So uh, this node here to um, look which client came there and li uh, downloaded the list of um, of servers. So this uh, directory authority will also see um, the the client of Alice. So this these are the two points where we can gather some data. So as I said here, the clients get their uh, network view from the authorities, and yeah, you need to somehow recognize the Tor clients, but. Um, in the current design, it's also so that uh, you can set up your Tor relay to be a directory mirror. So it means your relay, your Tor server, also mirrors this directory information. So um, the client of Alice here, we'll go back to this slide here, uh, doesn't go every time to Dave, but it can also go to this node, for instance, and ask it for directory information. and also, the, uh, this this node can handle uh, it over to Alice uh, and give it to them. So there are some possibilities to to hand over directory uh, information, and all all those nodes have the, the ideas. And as I said, um, entry nodes these can be guard nodes or bridges, and the guard nodes can see by design the client's IP as well as all uh, IPs of other relays. So. An, an entry node can also be like a, a, a middle node for other circuits, etc. So uh, if you want to ask the, the guard node, um, you have to decide if it's a known, well-known Tor relay or if it's a not, not known relay. And in the last case, then it must be a client. So and also a bridge. Bridge is like the, the uh, first uh, entry into the Tor network. Only sees clients' IPs. It will never see uh, other IP addresses. So um, you can uh, collect it at some points. So, uh, you, so now you, we have identified the, the collection points. So, and the, the another and quite more important question is how to do it right. So, how to do uh, collect those data without hurting the anonymity of uh, the user. So, the, the the most obvious way or the the, the, the naive way I would say uh, to do measurement would be the following: just collect. Every, uh, every IP address at the directory authority or at some entry node, send it to some central server, and the central server does analyze all the data and puts out a nice graph or something like that. Well, but I think we can, uh, if, if, or if I ask you, we can sit here for the next hour and uh, think about all kinds of attacks because this approach is so vulnerable. You, I think every one of you will, will find some attacks and we can basically de-anonymize um, the user. So that's, the, that's not the right, right way to do it. Uh, so we, we need to think about other ideas. So basically here, what you see on the right-hand side, this is uh, the graph of the directly connecting users since 2011, so over the last four years. And uh, you see here, w uh, first there were uh, something below one million users per day, and then we saw a, a huge jump which happened somewhere in 2013 and then the numbers went down so and yeah it's, it was like in the middle of 2013 and when you think about the snowden revelation they were also in the, the middle of 2013 and you might come to the, uh, the conclusion well did this was because of of the snowden revelation but that's not true. It was not because of Snowden, but uh, because some Ukrainian guy set up uh, a malware uh, uh, botnet, and it, we wanted to use um, a Tor for internal communication. So basically, what you hear see, what you see here, the jump in, in user numbers from like below one million to more than five million, are, uh, or is, is a or was it was a botnet, and so uh, after some time, the, uh, the this uh, botnet was was cleared. They deactivated uh, the client, and so like I think, I think here at this point, there were more or less more real user numbers again. But Microsoft tells that they are there are also some 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 clients, some some botnet clients out there. So it's not really clear if this uh, the real user number or what the, the amount of, of botnet users are inside here. So um, another approach, another idea would be just to collect the IP and instantly geo, uh, geolocate the, the IP address because the only thing you want to know here in these examples is where does the 
the uh, Tor uh, user come from, so you don't need the actual IP address, but you don't, you will only need uh, the, the geolocation, you will only need the, the country where this IP comes from. And so you can basically do this, just look at the IP and make a geolocation and like since 2008 or 2009, Tor comes with a, a geo IP database, so it's, uh, you can do it on the, on the uh, side of the, the, in this case, so-called client. So this would be uh, fine. Um, so you can geolocate immediately, but uh, yeah, then you have to ask yourself what happens when, when if there are duplicate IP addresses. So how do I find uh, out duplicate IP addresses? So there is a necessity to store somewhere the IP addresses to uh, remove duplications. Uh, you can do it in RAM, and after some time, just write this uh, geolocation data onto the hard drive. That's a, that's a basic idea. So, but then the next question arises, what happens when, when there are countries with few users? So you see here a graph, um, they are di directly connecting users from Vatican City. So the Pope and his staff also obviously also use Tor. Um, so, and there are like, uh, so five to ten, so, so here's zero, that's the zero line, that's the five line, the ten line, and the fifteen line. So, you saw uh, between like nearly five to, to ten users, daily users are from, from the Vatican City. And, yeah, when you have uh, uh, countries with few users and uh, you uh, uh, push this information quite often, so like once per hour, for instance, or once per uh, a small amount of hours, it would be quite easy in, uh, uh, when an attacker, attacker gets this data and goes back to see who maybe uh, is, was using Tor uh, at this point. And also, um, you, you need to, to have some, some countermeasures here. So uh, one countermeasure in this case is just to collect uh, all the data over one single day, so over, one, uh, over 24 hours. And collect it then and also there is a, a try to obfuscate the, the number of users because the, the, the number of users are rounded up to an, a, a multiple of eight so that you don't see that the, you had only one single user at a given point in time so then the minimum amount you usually see is, is, is eight so that is, the goal is to obfuscate uh, it a little bit in, in face of the attacker. So in the end, some you can then do, so for instance, this nice thing here. So uh, some guys from the University of Oxford did uh, this uh, nice uh, graphic here. So they, they uh, showed the amount of daily tour users. Uh, and so you see here the USA, Canada, this is France, Spain, Italy, Germany. Uh, this one is uh, Austria. Here is uh, Switzerland, Czech Republic. Here's Iran, which is also quite uh, a huge uh, part. Russia, Ukraine, etc., etc. So you see here some nice um, graphic. Who is using uh, uh, Tor? So this is quite, uh, one of the results of these ideas. So and um, yeah, Tor over the time has then worked out several principles when uh, collecting uh, statistics. So they said, well, first there are some legal requirements. So in, in several states we have wiretapping laws, we have data protection laws, and we have to make sure that we don't fall under any kind of wiretapping law because it would be uh, quite bad. And also we have to make sure that we uh, uh, don't fall under some, some data protection things. So, so we have to take care about several legal requirements. Of course, the privacy of the user is, is quite important for us. We have to take care that we don't uh, uh, accidentally uh, de-anonymize any, any user. And also when it comes to, to university research, uh, it's quite often the case that you need um, the, the approval of the uh, uh, IRB, of the Institutional Review, Review Board. So they, uh, if you do some, some research and, and want to do it in an ethical, responsible way, you go to the IRB guys and they look what <coughs> you're doing and then approve it or don't approve it. So in, in, in psychology and in medicine, it's quite common to do this. In, in computer science, it's not really that common. 
<laughs> but at least in the, from the US side, I, I think it's, it's getting more and more common. Yeah, and, and in the end, so you can have uh, uh, like a research which is uh, which fulfills every legal requirement, which is ethically uh, approved, but you also have to think about um, uh, what the user thinks about this. So uh, at the end, maybe the user finds it not so good that you're collecting every kind of data. So what Tor tries to do is to public publicize uh, what they are doing so that everyone who wants to know it also can know it and, and can have a, like an informed uh, consent and it's not surprised that Tor also collects and measures some some data. So that's that's some some principles when it comes to to collecting data. So and yeah, and as I said, there are different roles when it comes to Tor. So and uh, every kind of role asks different questions. So there are some end users which just download the Tor browser, use it, and they want to know other things than, for instance, uh, operator of a directory authority or relay operator and the uh, measurement team which is uh, inside Tor developed uh, several uh, uh, tools to give uh, answers. And one of the, the important uh, uh, portal, I would say, is the Tor metrics portal. So when you go to uh, metrics.torproject.org, uh, metrics you get here to this uh, site and here you find all kinds of um, possibilities to uh, look uh, for, s for some statistical data. So you can, f for instance, find here the uh, number of relays and bridges inside the network or here the number of directly connecting users. So this is, is, was the first one. This is the, the uh, number of relays and bridges of the in, inside the network. It's quite easy to find out. So you just need to pass this directory authority data, and you see that there are like more than 6,000 uh, uh, relays currently inside the network, and something above 3,000 bridges inside uh, uh, the network. So that's, that's quite easy to do. The other thing is the number of directly connecting users. As I said, uh, this was the thing where my example started. So currently, uh, the estimation is that there are more than 2 million users worldwide per day. And if you say, well, I want to know about the Austrian users, I can also ask for Austrian users and see, well, uh, users from Austria are like 50,000 at the moment currently. And the data goes back to 2011. So you can also change here the date to 2011 and see how the uh, number of users developed over time over the last several years. So there is also data from, from before, from before 2011, but the, the algorithm before had some, some mistake in it and did, uh, did it the wrong way. That's why we only find data starting from um, 2011 here. So in Tormetrics, you find all kinds of, of uh, nice data here. Um, just if you have time, just browse around. I don't want to show everything here. So but uh, let's say I, I'm an end user, the first role. And uh, one of the important questions the, this, user, this kind of user asks is, am I really connected to Tor? So that's, that's, that's one of the, the, the first questions to him. And there is also a website here called check.torproject.org. Uh, this was the page which was shown by the Tor browser some, some time ago. Right now you see uh, another kind of page. So when you open the Tor browser for the first time, you see this page. It's uh, my, uh, my, my Tor browser is set to German, so it says, well, herzlichen Glückwunsch, so uh, welcome. Uh, this browser is, is, uh, uh, does use Tor. And when you see, uh, click here on Tor, uh, the check the network settings, then it calls this check.torproject.org page and shows you that you are connected with uh, Tor. And if you're not connected, you see basically here uh, this screen below. And behind that, there is a software called Tor DNSEL. It's a, a, a library written in Haskell. And this Haskell library basically looks at the directory data and then looks at the IP, which is connected to the uh, check site and says, well, you are connected, you are not connected. And it also tries to find out if the user comes with a, a, a Tor browser version 
or with, uh, with Tor and the non-Tor browser version and also shows here a warning. So in, in, in the future, there should be another uh, library, uh, Tor Bell. Uh, this is a, a rewrite of Tor DNS -EL, uh, which does basically the same. So th this Tor DNS -EL and Tor Bell uh, running in the background and uh, the thing which you see is the check, Tor project org site. And as I said, um, what the user quite often asks is, why is Tor so slow? So they, they try to use Tor and then they say, well, oh, this, this is quite uh, not, so, not so fast to use. And uh, at some points the developer said, well, we need to find out how we can make Tor faster. And uh, well, and here also you need data. And what they are doing since several years right now, uh, they uh, just try to download a 50 kibibyte file and also a 5 megabyte file and measure the time, how long it takes to download this file. So you see here a graph starting also in 2011, going to, to November 2015, and you see the, the, the time which it took to download it. So uh, this is the time in, in then in seconds, it must be in seconds. So uh, here in 2011, it, it took like 50 to 150 seconds to download the file, and then over time, right now we are down to don't know, 10 to 20 seconds for a 5 megabyte file. And here, this is a 50 kibibyte request, which was something between three and five seconds, and it's also down to one second right now. And so this, this measurement helped the developers to, to find bottlenecks inside the networks to improve the algorithms and to make it faster. And you can see over time it really improved. So Tor is getting faster, but of course it's still maybe a bit slower than normal browsing. So this is not really a, 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 a measurement for the end user, but in the end it helps the end user to get a faster connection. Another role here is the relay operator. So this, uh, I would say, an, an integral part of the Tor network because they run all the relays, they run servers, bridges, etc. And of course, such a relay operator has all kinds of questions. So the first question is when, when someone uh, decides to be a, a network or a, a relay operator is, where should I put my relay? So the first most obvious question is, maybe in the country where I am. So if I am an Austrian citizen, it might be a good idea to open a relay in Austria or in Germany or in any other country. But uh, what you see here is the so-called bubble graphs, and this is the, the distribution over countries. I can also try to show you it here uh, live. So it needs some time. So there, at the Tormetrix page, you find this network uh, bubble graphs. So you, for instance, you can say, I want to see exits, and they should be grouped by country. So you click here on this link, and yeah, wait for some time, and then those bubble graphs pop up. So that's the thing which I also had on my slides. And here on this uh, side, you can uh, now go to this um, bubbles and see, well, this, this is Luxembourg here, this is Switzerland, United States, this large one here is France, for instance, Germany, Romania, etc. So France is uh, the case because there's a, a, a huge provider in France called OVH, and several people have their relays uh, running at OVH, and this, this, that's why uh, here the, the bubble from France is so large. You see Netherlands is quite large. And I also tried to find uh, the same thing for um, Austria, but there is no bubble for Austria because Austria only has a handful of, of relays, so you won't, won't find it here. So then this, this uh, bubble graph thing here also can help uh, to, to say, okay, it might be not so good idea to have a, a, my relay in France, but maybe somewhere here in Moldi Moldova, which maybe have a good uh, uh, offer right now, and so you can set up a server there. And what's also quite nice is there's, so you mm, might not, might, maybe cannot read it, there's a site called compass.torproject.org, and here you can have a, like, a list like thing of the distribution of, of Tor nodes in, in a country, or you can also select it via AS, for instance, or via some other 
things. And so this should be helpful for the relay operator to, uh, to decide in which country to put uh, your node because the goal is to have a, like a diverse network. So um, you maybe saw it in the beginning here, there is this Tor flow uh, site, which also, also uses some, some older data from, uh, from the Tor project. And this is not real-time data, but uh, the, the, those data is from uh, end of October this year. And you see here there are lots, it's, it's lots of traffic here inside Europe. So you see here the large France bubble, large German bubble, and you see that there's some traffic going back and forth to the United States. But a lot of traffic is here. And it's, it might be a good idea to have some nodes in other countries to distribute the network a little bit better. So and after some time, you, s you set up your relay, and it works. And you m might want to uh, check if this is really uh, useful right now, if it like, helps the, the average user. And this is what you can see here. So you, there are two sites called Atlas and Globe. You can reach it at atlas.torproject.org and globe.torproject.org and enter the name of your relay or some identification of your relay and it shows you some, some information. So I just chose one Austrian relay here and uh, took the, the graphs from uh, three months. You can see here this uh, relay was started at the end of October and then it just collects some traffic. In the beginning it was quite low and then it gets higher and higher and higher and right now this relay is at around four megabits per second on, on traffic. And what you can see here on the, uh, the second graph is the so-called exit probability. So when the relay was started, uh, it was set up as an exit, but uh, Tor, the Tor software, didn't consider it as an exit, doesn't use it as an exit, but only use it as here a an, an middle relay. So you see here the yellow line is the middle relay probability and the uh, red line is the guard probability, so the probability that it will get a guard, so the first node in the, in the network. And after some time, so after nearly a month, this node gained so much trust from the, from, like, the, the Tor protocol, I'd say, that it uh, was an, an exit, uh, so it changed to an exit relay, so and, and Tor gave it a, a exit probability, and now it can be used as an exit. So. The, the, the lifetime of such a relay is, is this, uh, was described in a blog post. So if you want to know more about the lifetime of such a relay, just go to blog.torproject.org and you find a description what uh, Tor will do with such a relay over some time. So it needs to build some trust at the beginning and so on and, yeah, and, and at the end it will be used. So, and now the operator has a running exit relay and it can be used for any kind of traffic, of course. And Tor offers for exit relay operators um, that they can get a nice T-shirt. So not this one, this is quite old, uh, but you can get uh, other T-shirts. And so after some time, um, this, uh, there's a, another measurement program called Weather, Tor Weather, uh, which looks for all existing relays and at some point, when you're eligible to get a t-shirt, you get a mail from this vessel software and, uh, which tells you, well, you now can get a free t-shirt from the Tor project. Thank you for running the relay. Please write a mail to this and that address and then you get a, a, a t-shirt. So this is also part of the measurement of things, this Tor weather program. And currently, there's another software in development called Tor Roaster, which probably will take over this functionality because Tor Roaster is, from my point of view, quite simple. It's a, it's a Python software, but nobody really maintains it anymore. And so uh, it was decided to, to drop it. But currently, it also runs. Yeah. yeah, and also, if you're running a relay, and especially an exit relay, at some point, some law enforcement agency might come to your house or to your office or send you a nice letter or whatever and say, well, I saw you did a bad thing. You hacked the forum. You did some, some strange things. And you said, no, I didn't do this. But, well, I run a Tor relay. Maybe some other random guy did it. Well, the police say, well, prove it. And what you can do here, what where also Tor helps, 
is you can go to another website. It's also part of the, the measurement uh, things. It's the website is called Accelerator. And this website tells you if a given IP at a given time was a Tor relay. So just, um, so, so this was the Tor browser site. But here is the, the accelerator site. You just uh, enter uh, some, some IP address. I haven't prepared anything. Uh, and a date. And say, please look if this was uh, and relay, okay, and uh, so, and here in this case it says, well, there is, I haven't found anything, um, but I just visited uh, somewhere the check site. Maybe I find it any, uh, here. <laughs> so I, I can just copy this uh, address here inside and uh, say if this uh, was an, an exit relay at this point, but it was also not a relay, so go back to 2015, and let's say some days earlier, so the, the 13th of November, and just wa wait a moment, it, it just looks for an entry, and uh, right now this IP address, as we saw, was an uh, a relay, and now we should get another answer here. So now you see uh, you've, uh, the Tor has found something, and here at this page you can see, well, at the 12th of November, we saw this, this was a relay. The name was Digi Guest Tor 2 E1, etc., uh, and so on and so on. So it gives you some, some information, and um, so Basically, the police can go to the site and, and question if, uh, if this IP address was an, a Tor relay at a given time. And as far as I know, for instance, the FBI does use it quite a lot to find out if an IP was a Tor relay or not. So and another uh, role inside the network are, this, are the directory authorities. So the guys who run um, the, the listings of all Tor relays and they need to take care of the network itself. So they need to find out if there are some bad guys. So uh, what they are doing, uh, they try to find out if there are cyber attacks out there. So if there are some, some relays doing some injection of JavaScript or do some, some other kind of stuff. And uh, there was a software written called Cyber Hunter. And this constantly runs in the background, tests several relays, and if it finds some, some relay which injects some, some strange things, it uh, sends a, a message to the directory authorities, and then they might decide to block this uh, relay. And so also, there are some misconfigured and also some other kind of malicious relays, and there's another software called Exit Map, which also runs on in the background, tests those uh, servers, and so try to find out if there are some malicious relays uh, and then, then block them. So you can run all those, those uh, software on your own. This, I, I have linked them on my slides here. You can find them also on, on GitHub repositories and try to find out if you can find some malicious relays on your own. And well, if you found a bad acting relay at some, some point, what I would recommend is that you contact the, the Tor project, so there is a, a, re, a mailing list called Bad Relays. Sent a mail there and said, well, I found a bad relay, it has the IP address, one, something like that, and it does this and that bad thing. And the, the um, uh, operators will try to, to find out if it does really bad things, and if they think so, they block this relay, and nobody will use it in their uh, Tor connection. So and there's also a wiki page which explains a little bit more how Tor these deals with, with uh, bad relays. So there is a, Tor tries to find out bad relays and uh, keep the network healthy and, and clean, basically. Yeah, and um, uh, Tor uh, metrics has quite lots of, of data available. So here is this Tor, uh, collect Tor site, and if you are interested in, in uh, discovering some own uh, things, uh, own statistics, uh, own things, you can go to this, the, the collector site 
and you find all kinds of data which was collected over time from the Tor network. So you find all, all relay uh, descriptors, you find other kind of things all back to uh, several years and Ku can do several things. And also, if you're a Python person, uh, Tor has a library called STEM, S-T-E-M, and you can use the STEM library to work with this descriptors here and, and do all kinds of stuff which you like. So this collector site is, is quite helpful and quite, quite usable. And so the, the metrics team, which is inside the Tor project, does quite a lot of development, tries to measure several things and, and well, to provi provide you with some, some more insights of the network. So basically, if you uh, want to know anything, just go to the uh, Tor metrics site, to this one here, you find s several answers. And well, if you don't find an, an answer, write a mail to the Tor project and ask and we will try to give you answers. So uh, I hope I gave you a, a short overview, this is a short insight into the measurement uh, tasks. Yeah, and if you have any questions, please ask and, uh, as well, and uh, I thank you for listening. Any questions regarding the pretty graphs? Yes. Um, thanks. Do you do you have a quick question to maybe something like the accelerator to check that checks whether an IP but it is shell based and quite quick, so I can use it in an automated blocking uh, procedure. Like uh, geo, uh, geo well, IP, I can easily. Well, I, I don't know an, uh, a shell based solution, but what you can do basically is go to the collector site and, and download all old uh, uh, descriptors and then have a cron job which also downloads the new. Uh, uh, um, description and then write your own own program which works on this this data basically so then then you you have to build your yeah, own i don't know i don't solve my problem but we will discuss oh, this so after. okay so i misunderstand you probably problem is for, for example i i recognize uh, um, attacks on my firewall want to block this ip mm -hmm. but i would like to look whether it's at all really before i block it so i won't block it if it's at all really. Ah, okay, yeah. And I would uh, like to do this automatically in the background somewhere without uh, much effort. Yeah, possible. there are some some uh, people out there which do this. So there is, um, just forgot the name, I think danme.co.uk. So th th this guy uh, does the same. He, he offers you some kind of, of library which you can insert in your web application, basically. Or if you uh, run, or if you use Cloudflare, for instance, they also try to find out if there's a Zator relay and if it does some malicious things and then blocks you. Or they, they actually don't really block you, but they, they show you an, a capture. And you have to solve the capture and then go to the page. So uh, there, there's a uh, page I have to, to look it up. So I think it was then me.co.uk, but, but I'm not really sure. Maybe, uh, maybe there's a tool that uh, compares IPs against the current consensus files. Maybe it's somebody already wrote that. Yeah, maybe. That would be useful. Yeah. There was a question? Yes. Hi, I'm very struck that there was a parallel operation doing pretty much the same metrics in real time. You probably read about it. It's at the headquarters of the NSA. Mm -hmm. It's called Ronin, and it, uh, its target is to produce every hour in the National SIGINT Operations Center a Tor exit node map, and to get such metrics as they can. Um, the famous, I think it's famous to everyone here, Tor Stinks paper that they uh, did with our friends from GCHQ in Yorkshire, uh, shows how desperate they were to find ways to de-anonymize. But yeah. that paper was three years ago. They're still working on it. Um, their concern is very clear. What I'm wondering is, in a cyber defense context, if you, are, uh, if you are setting any goal to protect anonymity of the user base, as a, if that is a core goal, and I don't know, so that's a question. And the second thing is, if you have awareness, as you would, that there's the dark side or the light side, yeah. however you see it, out there, running the same metrics to try and attack the anonymity base, 
um, are you trying to shadow what they're doing to spot the weaknesses and flaws? And if so, how do you approach that using the tools you've told us about? Sorry, long question. Hopefully it's comprehensible. Okay. So it was more a comment than a question. No, it's a question about are you taking on a... It's a question about are you... Do you have a policy goal to protect anonymity? And are you taking on, in effect, a cyber defense role, actively using your metrics to see what their metrics are seeing in order to modify routing or other instructions within the network? So it's two serious questions. OK. So the, the first thing, the, the, the policy questions, I, I, I hope I answered it in, uh, uh, in my, no, it was not here. S at some point, I have to f just find it. Um, in, in my slides, here it is. So uh, this is the basic I idea here. So uh, they uh, th taught rise to, to look after legal requirements that, that they don't fall, fall under several wiretapping laws, under data protection laws, etc. They they just uh, also look when they're collecting data that um, they don't uh, uh, accidentally uh, de de-anonymize user in, in, in some some way. And, and so, so they, they try to do it from, uh, look at it from, from this perspective. And all the data which are collected, which I showed you in the, in the other slides, um, so the, the, the um, data collection is done at the directory authority and instantly is, is geolocated, for instance. So, so uh, if there is some, some NSA who has, uh, this, this NSA has to attack the, the directory authority server, but when they are able to, to attack this kind of server, they have such a huge amount of data that, that those metrics data is basically not interesting anymore for them. So, so uh, that's why those directory authorities are run by, by persons who are, have a, a high uh, proficiency in, in IT security who, who look uh, at the systems and try to protect them against any kinds of attacks. On the other side, so we don't really know what the NSA is doing at the moment or what they are thinking. So, so there are some guys inside the, the tour who try to find out what the NSA is thinking about and then try to uh, build defenses against it. But th th we don't actually have an idea what the NSA is doing. So m maybe uh, so that's the only, only way I, I can answer it here. So, but uh, there, there are some, some people are trying to think about possible attacks, possible weaknesses in the client and then tr try to find some attacks against it. Thank you for the pretty graphs and the insights on the tour metrics. Thanks for listening.